You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Kev Carthy. How are you? How's it going? Yeah, good, good to see good you. Good to see you, yeah, Kev. Yeah, you too. How are you feeling? All right, yeah, yeah. Bit bit of an unusual um, atmosphere for me to be in like this. Different. Yeah, yeah, a bit different, but yeah. From your life, from, it's like from crime to Christ kind of story, yeah? Yeah, From arm really robbery, is. now you're a pastor and yeah. doing great things, healing people. Mm-hmm. It's your journey. I love that stuff. Like I'm open to everything, Kev. Like, mm. I'm not, I don't care your religion, your race. If it works for you and you're not harming people, I'm all for it. But mm. from your story, not a story of redemption, but from what you've been through and trying helping people, but I actually met you through a good friend of mine, Luke, yeah. who I'd actually met in Marbella 15 years ago when we were working there. And um, I, do you know what I always thought about Luke? It was always mm. in my mind. I says, where is he? And I used to, I never couldn't remember his second name. Mm-hmm. And then last year he reached out to me, went to his wedding. Um, amazing, met amazing people, great night, met yourself. You were telling me your story, I was telling you mine. And we connected. Mm-hmm. And then you reached out just a couple of weeks ago again. And now here we are, brother. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't think it was um, a coincidence with the timing and stuff like that as well, you know. Because um, uh, when, when I called you, you said that you'd been uh, a couple of days before that had been thinking about me and stuff yeah. and thinking of doing a, about a podcast and stuff, mm-hmm. you know. I think that was a God incident. I think that even Luke meeting you, it was all meant to be, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This is what I believe in, you know what I mean? Life works in mysterious ways, yeah. as they say, Kev. It's, um, mm. yeah, it's just, it's just life. We're all battling through some sort of mm. madness. Like I say, everybody is different. We're supposed to actually do a podcast with Tony Argent, mm. which is, who was a convicted murderer, trying to change his life, so it would have been the convicted murder, convicted murderer and the pastor, the two he's sitting together, but he's got his dates mixed up, but it's a good time to get your story told, mm. and then we're getting Tony on next week, so two years will still do it anyway, which I think is going to be phenomenal. Mm. Um, I always go back to the start with my guest though, Kev, where yeah. you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, I grew up in Leytonstone. Uh, uh, I was there till I was about 20, about 20 years old, you know. Pretty normal life, really. Um, you know, my parents, you know, some people going through different things and ended up in prison and stuff have got, like, some horror stories. Well, mine weren't really a horror story, you know. Um, I did always have a feeling that, you know, not putting this on my parents, but I did always have a feeling that, you know, maybe I weren't good enough and things like that. I, I, I suffered um, a little bit with rejection and stuff, you know. Um, and so as I got older, you know, I'd, I'd quite often, uh, in my younger days, I'm talking about from infant school, you know, I was quite an easygoing person, you know, had quite a soft nature and stuff. And and because of that, quite often, you know, people, other kids would come and want to start with me and start a fight with me. So from infant school was the first time, you know, and then I'd end up reacting to it. um, And it kind of just went from there, really. So, yeah, I was um, quite a bit of violence and stuff like that. Not maybe some of your guests have had, but, you know, I started off with that sort of stuff. Um, And I kind of, as I got older, I kind of felt uh, I'm not really going to make nothing of myself unless I unless I take what I want you know what I mean uh, unless I can get it and get it the, the wrong way really because I didn't really have a lot of um, confidence in myself to make it through working and stuff you know so that kind of started my journey from really young age probably 16 or 17 I had it in my mind I wanted to do armed robberies that was what I had in my head like you know and I, there was different incidences where I nearly went and done it like I was with um, there was a boy uh, up in Leytonstone who was, who was 18 at the time and we was meant to go and do this. He said, oh, I've got this imitation gun. So I said, all right, lovely, let's get it and let's, let's go and do something, you know. I was just really determined and that's, that's what I was going to do. And so we went to his house and then he went in and he's obviously had second thoughts about it and he's come out and said, oh, like, oh I've got to go somewhere with my family and that, you know. And he said, um, you know, oh, maybe we won't do it, like, you know. Maybe, you know, another time, he said. I said, all right, no problem. 
it's kind of went on. There was a few different um, scenarios where I nearly got involved in things. And, you know, one time outside a building society in Stratford, we was going to go and rob the, rob the place, you know, and we'd, we'd had it all planned. We, we called ourselves the Lazy Gang, right? So, yeah, if I wind back a little bit, what had happened was there was uh, me and my mate Joey and, uh, and another guy, Yoss, who kind of come into the scene a, a little bit after, um, didn't want to get involved in all that. And uh, so what we do is say, right, we're, we're, we're going, we're, for some reason, we had it in our brain. We didn't really know what we was doing. It was like about 20, 20 years old, 21 at the time. And we was like, yeah, we rob a building site. The best time to catch it is in the morning. Yeah, this is, this is without our thinking at the time, you know. So we'd say, right, we're, what we do is, yeah, we set our alarm. We get up early because we were sleeping till afternoon at the time. And every time we'd end up, um, sleeping for our alarm and we go oh we've missed it it's too late to go and do it now you know and this went on for ages you know and uh, yeah so we called ourselves the lazy gang you know and then um, my, co- my co-defendant who ended up becoming my co-defendant who was my best mate Joey um, him and Yoss ended up going to do different things and, and uh, you know and uh I kind of missed my timing with it at that time and then later on we you know I, I progressed from puffing a bit of ash or weed at the time when I was 15 um, to I started getting into the raves and stuff like that. You know, when I was 20 years old, I went to my first rave, started taking pills on my 21st birthday. And then after that, I progressed a bit and started taking a bit of Coke. Not, not nothing serious, but I started taking a little bit of Coke. But when you're puffing, you don't want to work. Like, well, I didn't. Some people can, but I... Yeah, I, I, I was lazy when I smoked green. Oh, you I was lazy it. anyway, but the green just made this 10 things Yeah, lazy. same. I was, I was a bit lazy, really. I didn't really want to work and stuff, you know. And so I was puffing and I thought, oh, you know what, I don't want to go out, you know, I don't really want to go work and trying to look for an easy touch and stuff, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, we've, we've ended up, um, now I tell people, yeah, they say, oh, what are you in prison for? I say, oh, yeah, like I, I kind of, uh, oh, yeah, I've done an armed robbery, you know, because uh, it sounds better because I, I was really ashamed of what I actually done, you know. Uh, but my co-defendant come to me Joe he said look I've got this job to do like it's someone's house like you know and they've got this safe and he's got 30 grand and at the time we're like 30 grand like you know we're going to be set when that <laughs> I mean it lasts about two minutes but we're like yeah that sorts right out you know and he said um so yeah this this is what we plan to do go go into this guy's house and take this money long story short it, the, there weren't no 30 grand there we ended up leaving empty-handed you know uh, and then got stopped by the police on the way home um, done a random check, found us, they nicked us for going equipped and released us. We thought, oh, we've got away with it. The next morning, obviously, the guys reported it. They put two and two together because we was in the same sort of area. Uh, and then come through our door, mine and my two co-defendants and uh, like armed police come through there and arrested us. And now we're off to prison, like, you know. Um, I hadn't really gotten a lot of, you know, done a lot wrong, really, before that. I had a couple of little minor things, you know. Um, like there was a, a someone had stole a motorbike, a little moped thing, and and we found it dumped with a key in it. So we we took it and had a little go on it, and then we got I got caught for that. And another thing I'd done when I was younger, I was about fifteen, again trying to fit in. There was a, there was a, a, a co-op, yeah, with um, you know eggs and bacon, and they used to do all the f- f- um, quality st- what are they called family thingy biscuit tins or whatever they was called, you know. Um, and roll, you know these Swiss roll cakes and all this, and so I used to go in there and like, we say, oh, what should we do tonight? We, I say, oh, let's have an egg fight. I've got no eggs, no problem. I'll go and get some, and then I'd, I'd break into this, cut, go for the hole in the fence, you know, climb for the, the wall and stuff, and uh, and just get a load of eggs, you know, silly things really, or cakes and biscuits and stuff, just trying to fit in, you know. Uh, and I've done all this, like I say, I got caught for that uh, in the end, and um, and and then anyway. Moving forward now, I've gone. I've got done for this armed robbery. Uh, oh, sorry, aggravated armed robbery. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we ended up when we was serve when we was on remand. My co-defendant he said to me, oh, "Kev, I'm 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 getting back into uh, into the Bible and that. You know, I'm I'm back sort of following Jesus." And I said, "What?" Like you know, he said, "Yeah, yeah." He said, uh, w- "When I was a bit younger, I was 18." He said, "I was I was on the streets preaching the gospel, like you know." He said, then I met a couple of birds and I kind of got led astray and I sort of blew it all out, like, you know. He said, but I'm getting back reading the Bible again, you know. So it was 23 hours a, a day, bang up and jump to pres- prison, like, you know. So I thought, okay, no problem. So he started telling me about it each day and it got me interested. I started reading the Bible and, and um, loved it, you know, because it's actually, even if you don't believe in it, it's actually got some good stories in it, you know. And, um, and then I started going to the prison library 
I was getting uh, different books out, like Crossing the Switchblade and them sort of books, you know, and um, about gangsters and stuff that had become Christians and, you know, got saved radically or whatever. Uh, and so this is what I started doing, started getting right into it. And um, I got the vicar to come come to my room and, 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 and he prayed for me and I'd done this, what's called the prayer of salvation, which is inviting Jesus into my heart. That was all good, but I was still puffing, you see. So the whole time I was getting puff smuggled into the prison and stuff, I was still puffing and... And didn't really have a proper relationship. I had no one to guide me on or nothing like that with it. But I didn't really know what I should do apart from read the Bible, you know. And so um, I, I ended up getting sentenced. We got four years. Um, uh, like I say, it's the first time in prison. We got sent to a place, or I got sent to a place called High Point. Um, and I went in there, and now semi-open. You've got backgammon, table tennis. And I thought, here we go, you know. And then I just forgot about God, you know. And so when I come out of prison, uh, I've done just under two years. Um, when I come out of prison, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back to, I used to work for Dynarod before prison, you know, and that's, I didn't really want to work. What was that? Dynarod, like a drainage company, yeah. you know. Um, so yeah, I used to unblock drains and camera surveys and that Roddy type of thing. That. Yeah, yeah, good. I loved it. Believe it or not, I loved it. I must have been a pig in my previous <laughs> life. <laughs> not that you can have a previous mm. life, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah, this is what I've done, right? And um yeah, I loved it, you know, and uh, so I've went back to doing that, yeah, um, I lasted for a few years, so I was about 28, and um, and I was, I was kind of thought, oh, you know what, I started, to, I was still puffing, I started selling a bit of puff on the side, um, just to pay for my puff to start with, you know, and then I, I started earning a bit more money out of it, and it just continued, you know, so I thought oh, I'll buy a bit more, and then before I know it, I'm earning quite good money out of it. And then someone come along, they had these fake 50 pound notes, you know, and he said, I can't have got these, these are blinders. Like they was absolutely identical to the real thing, like, you know. So I started selling them. And before I knew it, I was making more money than what I could with the wages. And like I say, I was puffing and I was lazy anyway and didn't really want to work. So I thought, might as well go full time crime. And I just give up, give up a really good job actually. And um, continued selling drugs. It kind of progressed from there. You know, I started, um, uh, you know, taking more drugs myself, ease and, and coke and stuff like that. And then I thought, you know what, I might as well start selling it, you know. So at the time, there was a, there was a place, uh, I don't know if I should mention the, the place, but, but I shut down there anyway, called the Epping Forest Country Club, which is quite quite a famous place um, in, in Essex, uh, in Chigwell. But it was kind of like people come from miles all, all around from London and all that to go there, you know. So I started selling a few pills in there, but like no one else was in there at the time. I was like the only one, like, you know, and this place, it was a, it was a bit of it called the jungle, it like three clubs on a private bit of land, you know. And, uh, and so I started selling these pills in there and um, I was flying, like I was, I, I couldn't get enough. As quick as I had them, they'd sell out, you know. So what I'd done was I, I, I thought, okay, a few people started showing interest. There was more dealers coming in there, but I wasn't one of them dealers that would say, well, you can't be on my turf and all that sort of stuff, you know what I mean? I've just let everyone get on with what they're doing and I just minded my business, you know? But in the end, I had like four or five guys working for me and then they had guys working for them. And so we was kind of pretty much dominating the club. And the bouncers, we didn't have to pay the bouncers. They left us alone, like knew what we was doing, but just left us alone and stuff in there. And um, and so, yeah, that's what I was doing, making really good money, like, you know? Could have all the holidays and you know, all the nice clothes and have me little cafe latte and me panini in the afternoon. Happy days, I thought, you know, but I'll be honest with you, I never really had peace. I never really had peace, yeah? It was seemed nice from the outside, like money to do what I wanted to, all the designer gear and all the rest of it, but I never really had peace in my heart. Why do you think that was? Well, two, two things, really. I was never happy about what I'd done anyway. I felt quite embarrassed about what I'd done, like, you know. Uh, it wasn't, you know, something you put on your CV, like, you know what I mean? And, um, but I think that uh, the other thing is when... Me and my wife, I've got the most amazing wife, Zoe. Like, um, Shout out to Zoe. Yeah, love you, babe. <laughs> right. um, she's, she's absolutely changed my life as, as well as Jesus has, yeah. How was your relationship prior to that? Um, Did yeah, you have any? Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd relationships, yeah. Um, didn't really last that long, really. You know, six months or three months. Maybe, maybe I think I had one probably lasted about, about a year was the longest really. Is that uh, because you were still battling your inner demons yourself? Yeah, I think I had yeah, my own issues and stuff and I just I just don't know, I never seemed to be happy, you know what I mean? And um, you know, uh, sometimes they weren't happy and got rid of me, but quite often 
I just weren't happy, you know what I mean, for, for whatever reason. And I'd want to move on to pastures green and stuff, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So when you met Zoe, what age were you then? Um, yeah, when I met Zoe, I was still with Diana when I was 28 at the time. And um, I met her through uh, my younger brother, Tom. Big shout out to Tom. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I met her f- through him. And um, I just kind of met her a couple of times and, and f- with another crowd of girls and stuff. They'd get, come around my house and, you know, obviously um, uh, by this point I'd started selling drugs and stuff. And, you know, so some of the girls would come around and, you know, we'd become like fairly good friends, but not right super close, you know. Were you popular? Well, you know what? This is the thing. You know, like um, uh, a lot of what I was doing really, um, when I was selling drugs and stuff, it made me seem like I was popular. You know, if I cracked open a bottle of champagne, I'd say to, to, um, who was my girlfriend at the time, Zoe, like I'd say to her, blimey, there's only three of us that come out. All of a sudden there's 10 of us that come out, you know. Everyone would be, oh, how's it going, Kev, you know. And I'd give everyone champagne. I had all this money and all I was doing really was quite often back to my ass after giving everyone all their drugs for nothing and giving them the champagne and you know what I mean it was kind of like trying to buy love really a little bit I think you know mm. and um, trying trying to a little bit buy fr- I had one or two friends around me but I did kind of feel that I was kind of buying friends you know um, and so yeah we we um, uh, I, I, to start with um, Zoe uh, one day she said to me she killed me for telling this story. One day she said to me, oh, you know what? She, she had really bad OCD and stuff, you know? And she said to me, oh, like, oh, I'll come round and do your cleaning, like. And I said, oh, all right, yeah, no problem. she came come round pretty early. Still, like, by the night time, she was, she was still there cleaning, you know? And I said to her, look, you know, you don't have to go home if you like, you know what I mean? If you like, you can stay. I said, no funny business, you know what I mean? Like, I said, oh, honestly, oh, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> Gov, <laughs> I said, no funny business, you know what I mean? You can come, you can stay, you know, if you want, you can take the bed, I'll sleep on the armchair or whatever, you know? And, um, and so, and so <laughs> that was for the night I said, but, um, and she kind of, that was it. She never left. Like she just moved in kind of thing How after long that. You you know? each other? Uh, yeah. We've been together about, about 27 years now. Yeah. About 20, play, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. So yeah. I'm lucky to get past 27 minutes. Yeah. 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 Well, you know what? Maybe the right one ain't come along, you see, yeah. um, you know, um, so this is what happened there, you know, uh, she certainly was the right one for me, you know. So we used to have a, a, a bit of a drinking problem, you know, and I used to have a problem with coke, you know. I'd be standing there, maybe four or five mates and stuff, and we'd be all talking, and Zoe would be there in the crowd, and we'd be talking, and all of a sudden I'd say to one of my mates, are, are you taking a piss, like? And they'd say, what, what are you on about? You're trying to chat my missus up in front of my face, like, you know? Start getting paranoid, you know? And they'd say, Kev, don't be like that, you know? Like, what are you talking about? I wouldn't do that to you. And uh, and then and then I'd, I'd say to, like Zoe, my girlfriend at the time, say, Kev, honestly, you really weren't doing that, honestly, you, you know. And, and so in the end, I'd still think it other times, but I'd just say to her, I wouldn't embarrass myself anymore in front of my friends. So I'd just say to her, Was he just trying to chat you up? Is he taking the mic like you know? And she'd say, No, babe, honestly, you know. So I realised I had a problem with coke, and I wasn't using the drug no more. It was using me, you know. And so I decided that. I was going to give up coke. She she had a bit of a problem with with alcohol, with spirits and stuff, you know. And sometimes I had I, I had a bottle up on top of the cut, kitchen unit and things like that, you know. So both of us said, all right, well, she'll give up the drink, I'll give up the coke, you know, and and we'll do it together, you know. And that's that's how we done it, you know. And um and so um yeah. yeah did so, you get help? Did you go to meetings? No, no, I never done meetings. I, but I don't even. I mean, I suppose they must have existed back then, but I hadn't really heard of them then, you know. I just just done it, you know. I, might, I think I have got quite a good willpower for things, you know, because I've stopped a lot of things in my life, you know. Um, uh, but I carried on taking pills. Uh, I carried on taking speed and ketamine and things like that, you know. So you stopped coke, but you took everything else. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I kind of felt that I never had a problem with the other bits. You know yeah, what I mean? They were just doing that more. Yeah. Every weekends and not every day? No, no, no. I was out I was out serving up, you know. And so I was out sort of um I don't know, six nights a week normally out selling drugs, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um uh, normally try and have one night off, but I was out all the I'd done the circuit, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Charlie Chan's in Walthamstow and that and uh you know, Faces uh nightclub and Gantz Hill. Like oh, it's the little yeah, little triangle. Haunts, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the country club I was there, you know, um twice a week at mm-hmm. Forest Country Club. And, um, and so this is what I've done, you know, but um, when, when my wife, that we was only together about three months, like she always says, oh, you know, like where I was taking the drugs and stuff, I think it cancelled out the pill. I said, no, babe, 
no, babe, you was nutted all the time. Like, we was up for three days at a time sometimes, you know, uh, on a Friday to Monday, Monday afternoon, we'd end up going to bed, you know. And I'd say, no, babe, you was nutted, and I think you just forgot to take it. That's the, the reason. So she ended up falling pregnant pretty quick. And we said, what are we going to do? She said, what, what should we do, like, you know what I mean? And, and I said, well, Sank was in me to say, I never really... Look, I'm not criticising anyone who has done it. I know it's quite a, a, um, a thing now that people do, but um, uh, me personally, I always thought oh, I didn't want to get go through abortions and things. You know, I just I don't know. Same kid me that didn't want to do it, like you know. And so I said to her, well, let's just have it, like you know, let's just have the baby and just see what happens, like you know. So we were still pretty, yeah. To start off with, maybe I think, I, think I skipped the story. I didn't know because uh, well, to start off with, we we was like the first like. I don't know, six weeks or something, we literally would go in our underwear and just cuddle and go to sleep like friends, you know what I mean? And, uh, and that's how it was. But obviously... He's trying to be respectable. I'm trying you. to be respectable. <laughs> no, we honestly was to start with, right? Yeah, people, I'm not going to believe yeah, that. Yeah. People are going to watch you no, think no. you're lying. God, God, is, God is my witness. But then one day, obviously, you know, obviously um, mm. things can happen yeah, and, and they happen, you know? if you're partying, man, things... Yeah, yeah, you exactly. You kind of your bearings as well, don't you? Yeah. It's just kind of... Go over the floor. Yeah. And then yeah. boom, chap at the door. And this is what happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, we, we kind of, um, yeah, entered into a, this relationship and stuff. And it was, you know, uh, it's mad because before we knew it, she was pregnant and, and that. And then she, Zoe stopped, obviously, as soon as she found out, she stopped drugs straight away, you know. I carried on because I was out selling. It weren't going out as much, but I was still out quite a bit to earn me money. Um, then about a month before she had my eldest Scarlett, um, I said, like, that's, that's, that's it. I'm, I'm giving up all the, all the other stuff, you know, because I, I just didn't feel right to be taking drugs and to be a dad and I didn't want to be impatient with the baby and things like that. So I just, I knocked everything on the head, like, you know. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, that was quite a challenge, you know, to, to be selling drugs still. Now, now I'm thinking, ah, oh, this ain't right. You're selling drugs before I could justify it because I was taking them, so it was okay. But now I'm not taking them no more. And I, got, I didn't feel, so I, didn't, I weren't happy about what I was doing to begin with. And now I'm feeling even worse because I'm feeling you're poisoning everyone else, but you're not taking it yourself, you know. And so that, that kind of weighed quite heavy on me. I still carried on doing it, you know. And what had happened was I'd say to my missus, look, the devil is definitely on my case. Because I come out with some stuff now and again. She's like, where are you getting? So I'd say, babe, and I told her about how I got saved in prison and, you know, I come away from it. But I knew... The Bible, I'd read it over and over in prison, you know. And um, so I had some sort of knowledge on it. And I said, the, the devil's tempting me. Every time I'm, I'm talking about giving up, all of a sudden I'm getting another grand or two grand a week. I'm getting another customer to work with. Like, and, and it just carried on like this. The, the country club days come to a bit of an end because um, I had one of my guys get nicked. Um, one got nicked on the way to the club. And then another one got nicked outside the club. And I was thinking, ah, oh, this could be related because it was really high profile. Everyone knew I was a drug dealer, you know what I mean? And I just thought, this is getting a bit much for me, you know? So I come out of there and then I started going just wholesale, yeah? Um, you know, selling bigger bigger bits to people that were going in clubs and whatever, you know? And it's kind of progressed. And every time I thought to give up, I'd get more money or bigger customers or, 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 or better suppliers, cheaper products, you know? Um, in the end, I was working um, uh, with a, a, a Jamaican uh, Yardy gang um, and they was, you know, I was their top guy. They basically give me everything. They was getting like 10 kilos a week and I was taking it and doing it in a day. Like, you know, they couldn't get, get it quick enough for me to, to sell it. You know, I was earning huge amounts of money. I was um, uh, I kind of always used to think, how can I make more money at this, you know? Now, I'm saying all this not to glorify it, but I just want to show people and tell people how far I've come. That even me, this sinner that should have been thrown away in hell, um, or, you know, um, God loved enough to send his son to die for me still, yeah? So I just want to, I'm not glorifying it, but I, I do think I need to sort of just say, if yeah, there's other people, story, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if there's other people go done the same things and think yeah. like I did, that you, you're not good enough, you know? I got a lot of messages, people back on the predictions, mm. cocaine, heroin, crack, mm. valium, weed, people battling, gambling, drink, mental health, it's people just battling, so mm. no matter the guest, there's always something there for people to pick up to try and make changes in their life now. Like he says, we're not glorifying it. We don't glorify people no. anyway, but it's to get a better understanding of mm. you. 
what you've done, what you what you were about in the past, what you've done to make the changes, and what you're all about now. Mm, mm. Do you know what I okay. mean? So when you started doing all your stuff and you were doing 10 kilo a day, what mm. was the outcome? Well, yeah, I was earning this, all this money. That, um, uh, I was, uh, you know, just continuing th- doing different things, doing grows. I was doing, um, uh, I had a, bought a machine to manufacture ecstasy pills and speed tablets I used to make with it as well, you know. And it was, all seemed all right. You know, the money was all right. But like I said, I never really had the peace, but the money was okay. Um, and then and then one day, it, the maddest thing, this is where I might lose your audience, all right? When I tell you this next bit of the story, they're like, yeah, right, yo, mate. You know what I mean? He's lost the plot. This is what happened to me. One day, God spoke to me, yeah? And it weren't like the movies with a big booming voice and stuff, yeah? He spoke to me, which I, I later on found out was spirit to spirit, yeah? So we're, we're obviously um, a triune being, you know, we're um, spirit, soul, and body, yeah? And so God's Holy Spirit, or his spirit, spoke to my spirit, yeah, and it was like he said to me, "This is what, like I said, I was doing all this coke and all the rest of it and all the pills and everything else. And the machine on its own would have got me a, a, a big term, you know." He said to me, "Stop what you're doing, or you're going back to prison for a very long time." And I had this fear. There's a spirit called the fear of the Lord, which is one of the seven spirits. You know, I felt really scared, and, and there was stuff that went on for about two weeks. All different things kept happening, you know. And I come back to my missus and I said, "Babe, babe, listen." God spoke to me today, right? He's told me to stop what I'm doing or I'm going to go back to prison for a long time. And she went, yeah, all right, babe. He's like, yeah, he's getting high on his own supply again. <laughs> <laughs> he's lost the plot here, right? And um, I was going, no, honestly, he spoke to me like, you know. She's like, oh, okay, kind of taking it a bit, bit more seriously, but, you know, still probably, you know, not 100%. And so um, at the time, um, uh, you know, I told, there was a guy that I, I used to work with, one of the Yardie guys, and I said to him, look, the the um the, the I really feel this is for you as well. I feel God spoke to me, and I think it's for you as well. Like you know, and uh, he, he's a really lovely guy, and his 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 um his mum uh, was a Christian as well. You know, he kind of listened, and he said, "All oh, right, okay." Anyway, so, so you'd think at that point I would stop, right? That that would be enough for me because I was scared, but but I didn't. I carried on, yeah. And so the first thing that happened, um. After that, I'd, I had two different warnings. The first one, I had two kilos of cocaine, and I was sitting in. I, I, I used to. It was a new. I bought it from new and all that, but a little Fiesta. I weren't all, all the flash cars and the flash. But one sort of half nice watch, but nothing all flash. What everyone done and baited themselves up, you know. I kept everything low profile, and I was I was in this little full Fiesta, in parked up in the back street in Leighton, right, with a mobile phone, but. Back then, not everyone had the phones, you know? So so it was a lot of drug dealers had, and one or two other people, but, you know, it was more suspect to have a mobile phone then, you know? So I'm sitting there, and I, normally I had a driver that had run my things, and, and and this particular day, I thought, he'd done it all, I had two left over the next day, and I thought, oh, you know what, I'm just running myself quick, it's up the road, I've just run into my mate. So my mate sends his driver, and I'm sitting there waiting, and I said, I, I, I'm like, phoning my mate saying, it's taking the mick, like, because they're meant to be there before me, you know what I mean? I'm meant to go after. I said, he's taking the mick, your driver ain't it. He said, oh, Kevin, should be there any minute. I said, yeah, but he ain't here. I'm sitting here waiting, you're going to get me nicked, like, you know? But as I said that, I'm having a guy him down the phone, I've turned to my left, and look, there's a police car going about two miles an hour past my car, both of them are, like, looking in. And uh, I thought, oh, I'm nicked, but I, I thought I've got to style it out, like, you know? So I've looked and looked over and kind of looked back, I just went, I started laughing down the phone and my mate's going, what's going on here? I like, you know what I mean? I thought I'd lost the plot. So I said, look, you're, um, uh, and I waited for him to get out of shot and I said to him, look, that's the police just gone past, tell him to hurry up, like, you know? And they've gone round, so I thought, right, it's a one-way system. Maybe they'll come round and back on themselves, you know, and they might, might kind of come and uh, uh, have another look at me, like, you know? So I've jumped out of the car, I've hid the thing under someone else's car. Then then I've got back in my car and I thought, hang on, I'm in Leighton here. At the time, it weren't as nice as how it's getting now. I thought someone might see it and nick it. It's like, you know, quite a lot of money's worth of stuff. So I jumped out, got it, put it back under my car. I'm like really bait what I was doing, like, you know? And uh, and then anyway, by then, my mate ends up coming past. I grab it, give it to him, he goes, and I got away with it. That was the first warning. The second warning is I used to make the make the pills in the house, and every three or four months I would I would move houses, you know, uh, and so uh, uh, what would happen was I would give the guy a drink, 
he knew what I'd done, not exactly what I was doing in there, yeah. but he knew I was a drug dealer, you know. And uh, and so what I'd do is um, I'd give him a drink so I wouldn't be on the idea of it, but I'd move every three or four months, just move about, like, you know. And um, so, so I'm an agent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, just rented a place, like, you know. Yeah. So one day... Um, I oh, care. There's a knock on the door. Whenever you've got a knock on the door in these places, you know, you'd think, like, is it police knocking to see? Because neighbours are reported that it's a bit suspicious, the activity, like, you know. So I've looked down the stairs and it's like a sort of smoked window and I can see a suit there. I'm thinking, oh, no, like, you know what I mean? It might be CID or... Yeah. But obviously, if they knew what I was doing, they'd have come through the door, like, you know. So anyway, I'm like, stop the machine. For every, every clonk is... is knocking out one of these pills like you know so I've turned it off and I'm just waiting up in there but I used to change all the locks of the, uh, of, uh, uh, the front door and the back door and stuff whenever I'd go into a place so that no one could get back in just in case the landlord come around being nosy or whatever you know but I could never find the key to the back door so I'm telling my mate look there ain't no key. He's saying, no, no, it's definitely there, mate. It's definitely, I'm saying, no, no, it's not there. It's not there. <laughs> right. And um, so anyway, I changed the front door, but didn't change the back. Dev obviously must have tried to come in through the front, couldn't get in. But on the side, it was in Forest Gate, this place. And on the side of the house, there was like, it was like a shed in the back garden, but it kind of op opened up a door to the, to the side road sort of thing, you know. And uh, anyway, next thing I've heard, on the door, or the bedroom door that I'm, I'm in, like, you know, and I've got my surgical gloves on and that, and I'm like, oh, someone's at the door, like, but I'm thinking, is it police? But obviously they're knocking, so maybe it's not, but I, I just don't know, all these thoughts going through my head. So I've took one of the gloves off, and as I'm opening the door, I'm trying to put the other glove behind me back, taking it off, like, and shutting in the, the, uh, the door and stuff, because there's like, like a thousand at a time are these are these ecstasy tablets and speed tablets all scattered over the floor and drying and doing all different sorts of things you know and um and so i've come out I said, what are you doing in my ass to this guy who was in the suit and he went yeah but it's not your ass is it it's their ass and it was a, um, a father and a son uh asian guys you know and uh they they he said it's their ass like you know and i said yeah yeah but i'm renting it he said yeah but you ain't paid the rent I said, yeah, I have. I've paid the rent, like, you know, because what I'd do is every time I'd move, I'd wait and I'd maybe use up two weeks of the deposit, you know what I mean? A week or two two weeks and then move, you know, so they didn't waste all the money, you know. Um, but, I mean, without going into this part of the story, part of the money weren't there, basically. It wasn't wasn't there. The, the last month's month uh, it didn't get paid, you know. And so um, now I'm behind and they're looking for their money. So I said, look, I promise you, if you're owed any money, like you'll get you I'll, I'll promise you i'll meet you tonight and pay you the money like i just want to get them out of the house like you know and all the downstairs obviously there's no furniture in there there's like newspapers on the front and floor it looks suspicious anyway you know so i've got them out of the house i went to loaded all stuff in the hold all and i thought you know what let me just go outside you know in case in case they're outside waiting you know so i go outside that the they're still outside the front door and i'm like oh, honestly i promise you but as i was walking out i said god God, Lord, please get me out of this. Please, Lord, I promise you, I'll stop. I promise you, I'll stop. So this is what happened. I come out, I talk them away, uh, talk, talk them away from the house. They go, I promise the guy I'm going to meet him that night, which I did, and give him the month's money, man of my word. Um, and um, But came back and just, you know, you think, oh, I've went to the toilet, have I took a glove off, have I got a print there? If I was just to leave everything, you know. So I went back, emptied it all out with someone that come and helped me and cleaned the whole place, disinfected it everywhere where I might have touched and stuff. And uh, and then we then we went. Um, anyway, so I said, Lord, listen, I've got all my money here. Like, I know I said I'm never going to sell, sell drugs again, but I've got to just sell this stuff, you know. Once I've sold this and sold the machine, machine, I think it was like about 30 grand. So once I've sold this, this would be my money to start again. To give me another chance, like, you know. So I said, once this is gone, that'd be me lot. And it was. I sold it all, got rid of it all, and then I stopped. So uh, what I'd done, um, I run around uh, with this big bag of money, looking to start a business and, you know, and change my life and come away from my old life, like, you know. And, uh, and, and so, yes, yeah, what I'd done, I, I kind of uh, um, bought a shop, put all my money into this shop. What kind of shop? It was really, you know, from going from a drainage company I worked for when I was younger, I bought a women's clothing boutique, you know, yeah, uh, in Buckhurst Seal. And, That's um, a classic drug dealer move, I know, though, isn't it? it is, I know. <laughs> Carboy sunbed boutiques. I know. I Sorry know for anybody that's got no, the businesses is. that might be legit, I, but for the no, people it makes me chuckle. Now, yeah. 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 
it's kind of the usual suspects. Yeah. So what made you, is that what made you change then, the thought you were getting caught, or did you have something inside you that you knew wasn't right? Because let's face it, drugs destroy lives. So it was destroying destroyed. your life. Destroyed. Mm. I've destroyed lives by it. Mm. I've took drugs myself, destroyed, it was destroying my own life. Mm. But sometimes you've got to think that all the shit that you do makes you who you are to then go, wait a minute, that wasn't right. So mm. once you become stronger, then I believe you've got the right to then try and heal others, which mm. is difficult because I always say it, I always repeat myself with this, but we all do battle. Mm. No matter what we choose in life, no matter Definitely. what religion we follow, no matter who you are. Mm. But <clears throat> I interview so many different kinds of people from gangsters and uh, sports stars, porn stars, politicians, actors, and they all have one thing in common is that every one of them are battling. No matter how much money they have, no matter how dark their story or how happy their story is, they're all still battling and searching, mm. which is crazy. But I think, I don't know, man, life is weird, Kev. It's, mm. it's a mad journey as a roller coaster. That happiness and all that, it's not a 24 hour thing. You have to work at it and, really and be truly honest with yourself, which is a difficult part. Mm. To truly admit that you've got problems, that you've got issues. But if you really want to change, you need to come. And if everybody knows the answers, I believe mm. something inside them knows what's right and wrong. If they're doing good in life, if they're doing bad, just be honest with yourself. Mm. Take a step back, right down, do you know what, I want to change this about me and that. You don't need to change it all in one day because mm -hmm. we're working on ourselves to the day we go. But when you started making your changes, how hard was it at the start? Really hard, you know, because I, I just threw all my money. Um, uh, um, I, mean, I mean, it should have been a lot more money what I, uh, to what I was doing, you know, but I just wasted it, spent it, you know, loads of designer gear and holidays, like luxury holidays and giving lots of it away as well, you know. Um, and so... The money I had was still half decent money to get started, you know, and um, but yeah, it was a real struggle like with this with this business, you know. Um, and what I found was um, uh, I was like when I dealt with you know people that had, you, you'd give stuff drugs and stuff to people, you knew where you stood. If they knew, if they robbed the the stuff off you, they knew that there was consequences to that, you know, that, that you weren't that weren't going to be the end of it. You know what I mean? Um, you just knew where you stood. But when I tried in the straight world. I found it was blinking worse than the... Yeah, it's harder. It's harder, yeah, you know, 100%. like... The, yeah, I mean, maybe it was just me, the the, the ones I fell upon, but, yeah. you know... Whether it's a product of drugs or a product of selling underwear, it's still a product. Mm. People are greedy. Mm. So it doesn't matter what you do. Everybody's out there trying to compete, trying to make the most, including myself. This has become a competition. Yeah. Like the podcast game, everybody jumps on it, but... I think, well, I'll show them. So I've always got gears I go through, but it's still competing. Yeah, of course. It's not as violent as the previous life, as the previous things. But mentally, you feel it. Because then, it's like you say, Zed, it is harder going legit. It is harder for some mm. weird reason. Like, no matter what it is you're doing, like, people's just constantly at it with each other. Like, what is that then? Okay, so is so that greed. So yeah, it's greed, and what what a lot of people do. This is what I found in life, right? People are happy to tread on you because if they climb on you, it means they can get a little bit higher than you. Yeah, that, so they're all always looking to elevate their self above you. It doesn't matter if they've got to walk upon you to do it. Now, I found that quite a lot um, in 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 the world we call it before before I was a Christian, you know, um, and I was always disappointed with people because I, I was kind of pretty old school with a lot of my values and there's certain things. Even though I'd done that crime, which I, I did think that you know that quite, did go really against the grain, but obviously I'd done it, so that's my responsibility for that, you know. Um, but I was quite old school with a lot of my values and stuff, and very loyal and stuff like that, you know. And I used to get let down a lot with people because they weren't always have the same uh, values as what I did. Not that I'm saying I'm any better than them, but I just I don't know. I just was pretty loyal, and and um, sometimes people weren't like that, you know. Um, and so. Yes, yeah, so I've done this business. So I've got Rob left, right and centre. We didn't have a clue what we was doing, so I can't even put it all down to them. We had a massive shop. It was in four parts of shop. Took a huge amount. It was turned over really good money. And, you know, it was on, on the surface, it looked good. But in the end, we lost loads of money. Um, we, um, we started designing... Right early on, now we were stocking like Dolce & Gabbana, Prada, Cacharel, Plains, so all these top Italian labels, Matthew Williamson, an English one. Um, and it was all really good. And, and then we, we designed our own label. Uh, we, we had a label called Punk 77, yeah. And so it started off with a pair of army trousers. Um, we got prints on these army trousers, put them out there, sold them out. Like It was like people couldn't get enough. It was such a different thing, having having these prints on trousers and stuff. You know, it's all different. And uh, 
And I said to my missus, you know, I've got quite a good eye for things normally. I said, we've really got a good thing here. We've got to start putting this with a wholesaler and, you know, like we've got to make the most of what we've got because we don't know how long it's going to last, like, you know. So we put it with a wholesaler and we had to come up with this collection and, like, we didn't really know what we was doing. We just had, had you know, some, some good designs and stuff like that, you know. And so this is what we've done. We've done all this, this collection, put it with a wholesaler. 45 accounts in the first season we opened up. It was doing really well. Uh, the shop... After the, after the first season was really hard work, was losing a lot of money. And so we start taking a lot of the money from the, from the label and putting it in the shop. Um, he borrowed a load of money from an uh, amazing uh, family uh, and stuff. And it just kind of went a bit pear-shaped, you know. And in the end, we couldn't focus on the label because the shop was such a struggle. It was like a monster to run, you know, a lot of staff and stuff like that. And in the end, it all went. We lost everything. We, was, we was rented a gaff up in Copsaw Estate, which is Rod Stewart used to live at the other end of the estate. It was quite plush and all that, you know. And um, yeah, we sold a house. This is what happened. We, we, we did actually buy a house with the money. We wangled it, like, you know. But we, we sold our house. And then we, because after all the 9-11 stuff happened and stuff, and they were saying property's going to crash and I was going to buy a bigger house. And so we sold that. I said to my missus, maybe we're the worst mistake I've ever done. Put the money in, you know, in the bank and we'll, you know, we'll wait till it picks up again, you know. But obviously it didn't crash, it boomed, you know. And um, and so we end up sticking all the money into this blinking shop and done the whole lot, all my savings, all my house money, the whole lot went, you know. <laughs> and uh, we ended up, had we had like his and hers freelanders, me and me missus, you know, and uh, it was quite in at the time, you know. And in the end they come, they took the cars, they they kicked us out of the house right we ended up homeless right in uh, a place called Norway house in in Northfield um and and that was me and my missus and me three kids like in, in a little but even then see God was in it God was in it even then oh I'll tell you, yeah so I missed that bit of the story let me rewind a little bit yeah so before we lost the business but it, it was um um sort of quite a way into losing quite a lot of money and stuff like that um we we had um our kids was in a, a Christian school yeah and um, we had a ghost in the house, yeah? And so, like, Coptal's quite famous for being haunted anyway, you know? But we was in, like, it was the gardener's house, which was like, quite a nice house and stuff at the time. And um, and it was it was haunted. Like, my missus, this, she was sitting in bed once, right? Reading a book, awake, like, you know? And then she said the bed compressed and sank, sat next to her in bed. And you know when you get in bed, you go, ah, oh, like this. Oh, thank goodness I'm in bed. She heard that sitting next to her, right? And, and she said... And she's freaked to write out, like, like, and and then this 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 um, spirit or whatever it was, a demon, as we now know, it's not it's not um, a person that's died and all that. It's all a lie, right? And so this this demon then um, uh, con it speaks to my son. Now, if you've ever seen Family Guy, yeah, Family Guy, when he got the evil monkey in the closet and all that, you know, and he points and stuff. My son said when he was three or four years old, he said, Dad there's a monkey with with evil eyes and it comes it sits on my bed and talks to me dad I don't want it to talk to me and he got really freaked out and really lost his confidence and all that and the, and the second time it happened it last months you know before he sort of got over it you know so we're thinking we need to get this house like um get get a um someone in to get rid of the ghost so said, who do we get in like someone said oh I know this shaman like they're, they'll help said oh happy days come in he burnt a few feathers made it worse right made it worse because right. well because because people think See, what it is, there's two doorways into the spirit world. There's the legal door and there's the illegal door. If you go for the uh, illegal door, you cause problems. You can start getting demons and, and stuff like that. Now, all this stuff's real. People get, you think it's what just the mean? moves. Okay, they can get, they can get, but certain people can get possessed, but most of the time okay. it's oppressed. Oppressed, yeah, or demonized is the actual word, yeah. They get demonized. So you can get, you can get spirits uh, that, that dwell in your, in your soul, yeah, and they can afflict you. Now, the, the Bible says that the, the, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He doesn't come to be friends with you. He comes to kill you. He, he, he hates mankind, the devil, um, and so that's what he does, yeah? So, and this is what people can get from being a part of the occult, yeah, or, or doing going through the illegal door. So this guy's burning the feathers. He's making it worse in the house, right? Um, I'm seeing things in reflections and quick glimpses of things, and it was like, you know, freaked, freaked us out. So my missus said... How about Stephen, our vicar, right? He's, he's like attached to the kids' school, like this 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 church, you know. So I said, oh, 
try it, you know. So we get him to come round. Um, he, he, he comes round and he's, it's on a Sunday evening or when he does church, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. He's left the curate in, in charge, like the under vicar in charge. He comes round, goes round the rooms. He knew the two rooms, what we was having, the manifestations of this, this demon in. And he said, yeah, I feel a presence in here. But he blessed all the rooms and it went. That was it. Um, never had an experience after that with it again, you know. And then he said, um, he'd come down to have a cup of tea and um, I was sitting down at the table and he said, so... Um, would you like to invite Jesus into your life? And I just thought, yeah, yeah, I do. God had spoke to me. We've had all this different, this journey from there. It's like, it was all getting built up for this day, like, you know? And I said, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, we both said, yeah, we'll do it, like, you know? So we gave our lives there, there properly this time, like, a proper committed, you know, because the first time I don't feel I was properly safe because I never lived that life, you know? And, um, and we said, he said, yeah, come to church, you know, be good to come to church. And so he said, yeah, all right. So on the way there, we're like, yeah, like we go once, you know what I mean? We, we just poke our head in the door, you know, be, you know, he's done this nice prayer and done this nice thing in the house and that. We go once and um, be polite, but I'm not going every week. No, no, I ain't going every week either, you know, just the once. So we get to the church, it's like big old Church of England church with the big old doors and that. Door sort of pulled shut. We got there a bit later, um, you know, with it. And, uh, and so we're outside the door and we're like, oh, we can't go in there, can we? Uh, and my miss going, no, we can't. I said, we're bad people. Like, we've done some bad things, you know what I mean? And uh, my missus said, she said, yeah, I don't think we can, can we? And we was just about to go. And then this couple comes out and they said, oh, you's coming in, like? We went, oh, we're not good like you. She's like, we're bad people, you know what I mean? She said, what? Don't be silly. All of us have made mistakes. Come in, don't be silly. It's for everyone. So we went in, had the ser service and that. We're thinking it's all going to be Kumbaya, me, me Lord, and all that sort of um, worship songs. It was like really good worship songs, like, you know, and uh, we really liked it. Like, we, well, we loved it, to be honest with you. And the whole service, everything was great. The sermon, everything. And we was back every week after that, you know. We wouldn't miss a week, like, you know. And it just kind of went from there. But what happened was... Um, about, about eight or nine years later, um, my wife had had depression for a long time since we had had trouble with the shop. It, she'd always had it from a kid, from a young age, a bit of depression, but never really manifested itself properly again from, from a kid until, until we'd come out of the shop and until the business failed and stuff, you know, and she got really bad, uh, really bad depression, was under mental health and stuff. She had OCD, uh, OCD uh, depression, insomnia, OCD, depression, and anxiety. Yeah, quite often they come hand in hand. Yeah, they're all kind of in the same category. Yeah, yeah, and it's quite common, a, a lot, of, you know, mm -hmm. amongst a lot of people now. So that years of drugs and drink, and then worrying about you getting out, maybe going to prison, plays a massive effect. Like every mm. drug dealer I know loses it all, mm. loses it all, and the girls that they're with end up with severe depression. Mm. They still chase that. I know guys in their 40s and 50s still try to chase what they had in their 20s. I know. It's unbelievable. Like, I know. Wake the fuck up. Like, it ain't a life. Any drug dealer, you're destroying lives to try and benefit your own. It will come back and bite you in the arse. Now, I don't believe, mm. know if you believe in karma, but something mm. plays a part in it mm. that, wait a minute, we've sold drugs and destroyed other people's lives to live this lavish lifestyle, to go on these fancy holidays. Whoever controls this world or whatever's created does. Mm. is going to say right wait a minute you think that's cool do you know what I'll give you a free pass for five years ten years but to come back and clean your soul or whatever you're cleaning you're going to have to go through this darkness yeah. that you've caused other people so here it is here's a mm. taste of your own, own medicine boom mm. and it's so difficult that people can't push through those dark clouds as well mm. and end up either taking their own life or not yeah. being able to change because mm. it's too fucking hard mm. for people to actually make changes but the beautiful thing about life is it can be done so when your message was going through that that time kev what were you thinking yeah it's really horrible like you know um uh, to be honest because i'd grown up with it as well um my mum had uh, depression you know um so to be honest i wasn't i wasn't as patient with it as what i should have been i should have been a loving husband and caring for what she was going through because it's a disability you get getting she, agitated with it yeah i was like oh here we go again you know what i mean and like it, it uh, when you got bad depression, uh, it affects the whole family. It ain't just the person that's got it. Uh, everyone's on eggshells, and it could say the wrong thing, and then it'd be 
analyzing, ah, oh, but why did you say that? But you said this, but you said it. Why did you say it? That's so hurtful and couldn't, you know, it'd be that's analyzing spirits and stuff, we call them, right? And it'd be, it'd be really hard, you know? And um, so what happened was, uh, as um, of, uh, when we was quite still early Christians, our vicar who led us to the Lord, he moved to Southampton. Yeah, and it was um, quite a big blow for us, really, because um, obviously he moved to another church, and it's you know he's going where his life was, you know. Um, but for us, it was quite it was quite a big blow and stuff, you know. And um, uh, you know he was a mentor and stuff as well, you know. And so um, yeah, so eight or nine years down the line of being Christians, um, my wife's got this really bad depression. She was like, "Oh, babe, I don't want to go to church today." Like she didn't want to leave the house. Sometimes for weeks at end, she wouldn't leave the house. Like you know, I'd have to do the school runs and stuff. We had like ten years of bad luck and all. You know, no money, no matter what I tried. You know, give up, lost my business. Anything I tried, you know, um, wouldn't work. You know, we we brought a curse upon ourselves by doing what we'd done. That's one, yeah. But what the devil does is, yeah, you've got the devil on you as well. So at first, it's all good. He's getting you doing the drugs and he's happy with that. Um, and he's going to use you. One day, he's going to take it from you, yeah, because what the devil gives you on one hand, he's going to take back off you with the other hand. That's what he does. His aim is to destroy you. But if he can see that you're destroying enough other lives as well, he'll leave you doing it for a while. And then sooner or later, he's going to bring, he's going to bring destruction to you as well as the punishment of God for what you're doing. What you is know? the devil in your, in your belief, Kev? Mm. What do you believe the devil is? Um, he's a created being who's created by God. He's not the opposite of God like some people think he is. Like, oh, you know, he's, he's not as powerful as God. Um, uh, uh, what happened was through pride was the first sin. Um, Satan fell from um, God's grace and he got kicked out of heaven. But what he'd, he'd done was he, he, he went round talebearing and he took a third of the angels with him, yeah? So his army is him and a third of the angels. Our army is God, who could take out all of them on his own anyway, you know what I mean? Because he's created them all. Um, he's all powerful, all knowing, all seeing. Um, and then you've got Jesus, his son, and then the Holy Spirit. Yeah, So it's three and one God, you know? Um, and so, so, and then we've got two thirds of the angels. So you know when people think, yeah, like, I'm tough and I do this, and oh, this firm, be a part of that gang, they're the top gang. I'm part of the top gang, yeah? My gang's the top gang. Now, you might be able to kill my flesh, but spiritually, you know, when it comes to spirit, spiritually side of it, you know, Christian people are, are a lot more powerful because they've got the Holy Spirit, not because of us, because we've got the Holy Spirit in us. Yeah? What's the difference between a pastor, a vicar, and a priest? Okay, um, um, pastors are, like, basically, it's about calling, like, Look, they can be called for God to do what they they do, like uh, vicars and priests and stuff. Yeah, but they've got to go Bible college. Uh, it's all theology, and it's you know so many years of training and stuff. I'm not too sure exactly how many, but I think it's like five years or something like that of training they have to, they have to do um, uh, before they can uh, get ordained um, as as a priest or, or a vicar. Um, with pastors, you, you haven't got to go through that training. As much to say as my wife went. Um, uh, to uh, amazing uh, Bible college, uh, uh, River Institute Bible College, RIP, and um, and so she she was um, she's done two years at that, but I haven't. I haven't got no training. I was expelled when I was like thirteen. My education's pretty poor, um, but you know, but God can use a donkey. It says in the Bible, He's used a donkey to talk to someone. So if He can use a donkey, well, maybe He can use me. You know what I mean? How much did it change Zoe's life when she start? When did she start turning around? If yeah, so, down. yeah, it, it changed her life, but she still had the th depression, yeah? So when we got saved, no one told us about warfare. No one told us about, um, you know, how to battle the enemy, the devil, you know, and his, and his um, demons and stuff, you know? We never knew none of that. We just knew about going to church, you know, yeah, feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and stuff like that, but we never knew none of the warfare. So what happened was um, my wife ended up getting to the stage, she said, look, Kev, I don't want to go to church like, tonight. We'll miss it tonight. And then I don't want to go next night. And it went on. She didn't want to leave the house. So we backslid, yeah? Uh, we backslid. We, we um, uh, you know, uh, I, I had no work. My kids was never in being able to go um, to any of the school trips because I had no money all the time, you know, barely had any work for, for nine or ten years. And, um, and so as a dog returns to its vomit, I promised God I wouldn't sell drugs. So I thought, oh, you know, maybe I, maybe I could just sell drugs then, you know, maybe I'll do that. You know, I didn't know what else to do, like, you know, didn't have no money. And so um, I'd done a grow, yeah, I'd done a grow in, in my log cabin in my back garden. How many plants? Uh, I can't even remember how many it was. It was about, I'm not even 
20 odd, I think it was. It weren't loads, you know, but it was going to get me a few quid, you know what I mean? And, um, and so in the meantime of, of, of doing this grow, um, I'll get a job, right? I'll get a job with this drainage company. Yeah, so I've, I've, I started working for them. I thought, oh, I don't need to do the grow now, but I never had no money to do this grow, so I got someone to, to buy the equipment and went off with me sort of thing. So I felt obliged to do it now, you see what I mean? And the grow had already been started. I thought, oh, I can't really get out of this, like, you know? And so um, I carried, I started working. Anyway, I was working with this guy um, and, and um, we're driving into Forest Gate to do a job, right? And uh, he's, I said, wow, I used, to, I, I used to rent a house down here. So I used to rent a house down here. Because uh, like, this guy used to take drugs and sell a bit of drugs as well. So we kind of knew each other. You get together like 11, 12 hours a day we was. We used to do really long hours. And so you tell each other a bit of your stuff, like, you know. And uh, I said, I used to rent a house down here. to sell me drugs from, like, you know. Went, really? What number? I said, I can't remember what number, but it's that big ass on the corner, like, you know. Went, Kev, that's where we're doing the job, mate. It was the house where I made God the promise that I would never sell drugs again. And in the middle of doing a grow, I'm getting a job at the same house that I made the promise. Now, some of you might say that's a coincidence, but what's the odds of that? We, the, our area we covered was inside the M25 and just outside as well. So we covered like millions of homes. That was like winning the lottery or, you know, that was the sort of odds of me getting a job at that house at that time, you know? And uh, and so that's what it was. So I got a job there, and I was like, "Whoa, this is God talking to me, saying so much for your promise." You because you, you should never promise God, never make a promise you can't keep with God. You know, and, and I did, unfortunately. Who has God? So God is the creator of everything. God created everything, the whole universe, the earth. Like is is um, yeah, is is my father. Um, you know, I have a personal relationship with him for his son, Jesus Christ, you know. Do you hear voices or anything? Do you hear that? Uh, to be honest, sure. speaking? When, when I pray for people... Because I believe there is a higher power. Mm. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's God or... But somebody has created us and always say that. The heart, the liver, the kidneys, how our body functions. People say evolution or people can say we come from apes. Or some people say we actually come from fish. Some people say we're aliens. Everything... People see the world differently. Like, mm. I don't know, but I'm open to everything. Mm. I'm open to your beliefs and how you see the world. I'm open to how other people see the world. Yeah. Like, it's mad, but for you, like, I know people say, well, if there's a God, why is there so much badness in the world? What would you say to these, those what, people? What I'd say is, yeah, there's a lot of wicked things that go on in the world. Um, uh, things ain't going to get better for the time being, you know, because this is all in the Bible of what's going to happen, you know. Um, but what it is, there's, there's God, but there's also a devil, yeah. So what happened was, we was created... Um, we wasn't created to be made to love God, yeah? That we had to love him like robots because that's all we'd be, robots. So he created us with free will, free choice, yeah? So it's up to us to choose to love him because that's real love, yeah? He wanted us to really love him, yeah? Um, uh, and, and so what he'd done, he, he um, created Ad Adam and then from uh, Adam's rib came Eve and then, uh, and then what they'd done, the only rule they had um, obviously our understanding of it all is like a, a, a newborn baby compared to God so there's certain things we can't understand because God's his, his wisdom and understanding is much greater than anything we could ever comprehend but he did put in the garden um, the tree of, of uh, knowledge and he said look you can do anything you want but don't eat for the tree of knowledge because if you do you'll surely die so the devil comes in the garden um, as a serpent and he said look did God really say that? Did he really say that you can't eat it? You, you, do you really think you'll die? So he's still got the same tricks, the devil. This area makes lots of people fall to uh, different sin, you know. Oh, is it really that bad? Are you, you know, are you any worse than anyone else? This is what he does. And so, and so um, Eve fell first of all. She, she ate from uh, the tree of life. And then, and then she said to Adam, you know, have some of that like you know what I mean and then Adam met from it as well and then and then because of that when when they um and then they felt naked they covered their self up because of their shame and then when they come it's got to why are you covered covered up like normally they just walk naked and, and not think about it and then God seen that there was something wrong and then obviously he's all knowing anyway and then they told him what they what they'd done and then because of that sin entered the world you see so that was the first sin of man but because of that mankind got cursed so the ground got hard to work, whereas they didn't have to work it. Fruit would just grow. They didn't have to work the ground for, uh, for, us to, for, for them to eat. Then what happened was, then they had a certain amount of years to live. 
So whereas before they would live forever, now they only had a certain amount of lives, uh, years to live, which is still like, I think, six, seven, eight hundred years back in the, in, in the beginning days, you know. Um, and so this is what happened. We, we was born into curse, we was born into sin because of what Adam and Eve done. So what God done was to send his only son. Now you've got to get your head around this, right? Because it is really, really powerful. God was up in heaven, he looked down on, upon his creation and seen that they was worshipping all other gods. Uh, and, and instead of um, wiping us all out, which, which a lot of them deserved, a lot of us deserve, or all of us probably deserve, um, he took compassion on us. So what he'd done was he thought, I'll send my only begotten son down to earth. He'd be born of flesh, yeah? He'll suffer the wickedness of man. He'll be falsely accused because of, of their jealousy of, of him, of the miracle signs and wonders he was doing. Um, they was jealous, so they falsely accused him. Um, they took him into court. Uh, one of his own f best friends, or one of his friends, uh, betrayed him. Um, they beat him uh, with their palm of their hands, and they beat him up. Um, they spat on him, um, falsely accused him, and cursed him. Um, and then what they done was they scourged him, uh, which is a whip. Now this whip, they used to have bits of lead on it. Yeah. So when when they, when it hit the flesh and they pulled it back, it would take out chunks of flesh and quite often small pieces of bone. This is how brutal what he suffered for us. Yeah? And then after that. They um, took him to in front of the garrison of uh, the Roman soldiers. Um, they stripped him naked, so he bore our shame, yeah? Um, and they pressed a crown of thorns into his head, yeah? Then they nailed him to a cross, yeah? And while he was up there, think about everything he suffered. He could have called legions and legions of angels and wiped out the earth if he wanted to, yeah? Like one angel in the Bible killed 300 and something thousand people in one night that was coming against Israel, you know? And, um, and so... But he didn't. He, he didn't. He come for one purpose, to die. People say, yeah, but they killed him because he allowed them to kill him. He come as a sacrificial lamb so that the Jews in the Old Testament would sacrifice a lamb or have sin offerings for their sins. Well, he came as a one-time sin offering so that he could be sacrificed so that every one of us can, can be saved. Now, it don't come automatically, yeah, so that he done it for us. Yeah, he done it for every one of us. Every, no matter how bad you are, he done it for every one of us. But... There's, but it, it, it's, it's a legal requirement for us to take part in that. And what we've got to do is we've got to trust in Jesus like you would a parachute, yeah? You'd put it on, you know, you'd wear him, you'd, you'd trust in him, yeah? Uh, and you've got to repent of your sins. How many sins are there, Kev? Loads. Uncountable, aren't there? Yeah, there's all it's different. the seven deadly sins? Yeah, but, but there's... Is the, that different? Yeah, so there's... there's, there's um, yeah, there's seven deadly sins, uh, but there's, there's one sin what you don't get forgiven for. So there's one unpardonable sin. What's that? Yeah, so the, the unpardonable sin is um, uh, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so if you say about the Holy Spirit, um, saying evil, you talk evil, uh, like the word blasphemy, there's different, um, uh, there's three different uh, causes for blasphemy, but, but this particular one is when you talk evil and untruths about the Holy Spirit that don't ever get forgiven. Yeah. What about because we talk we've spoke many times now and you talk about people being cursed. Mm. Let's touch on that. Mm. Um do you think people can be cursed from generations to generations mm -hmm. from murder, um, disease mm -hmm. and it passes down? What is this? Yeah, okay. So what happens is um uh, uh, me and my wife have actually got um and we've got a, a team with, with uh me and my wife and uh Nancy. Uh we we've got a deliverance team. So we help people that are oppressed by, and we're talking about Christ, Christ, you've got to be a Christian to get, get delivered because it can come back worse. But basically, um, uh, yeah, we help people that have had generational curses. Um, we're, we're helping a lady at the moment um, that has um, done uh, a double murder um, and because and we've already done quite a bit of deliverance with her and it was uh, we found that there was all generational curses. So basically, our ancestors, it can be like 30, 40, 50 generations ago, um, our ancestors... A lot of them was quite wicked. They was uh, pagans, and and they would do a lot of uh, human sacrifice, animal sacrifice. Is that the white magic, black magic. Yeah, see this white magic, black magic thing they say. You see, see magic's magic. It's either of God or it ain't. Yeah, it's as simple as that. They're like, but people make it right. You know, like they say, oh, it was a white. It's only a white liar, or it's white collar crime. You know, they try and make it that yeah, it's not a crime, but it's still a crime. You see, so um, basically. A lot, of, a lot of the things we find is with uh, their ancestors, uh, they've practiced witchcraft or there's been incest, you know, uh, and, and if there's incest is quite often there'll be sexual sin uh, that can cause people to 
um, you know, like uh, rape or that can cause people to do incest themselves or it can, you know, a lot of the time, I'm not making excuses for people that do it because they've still got their free will to choose to do right and wrong, but quite often it's hugely affected by the curses that their ancestors have done, you know. So we, we take people for a process, um, we find out what the curses are. Um, sometimes the demons outright talk to us, yeah, um, and, and they'll, they'll tell us and we command them in Jesus' name because even Jesus' name is more powerful than the devil and his kingdom, just his name alone, you know. So we can command them to say um, how they got in there, how many generations they've got in there, and this is how we get it out. We find out the legal rights, we break the legal rights, um, we find out what diseases they've taken in, the sickness or disease they've taken into the vessel, into the body, uh, and we get them to lift the diseases as well. So all that gets banned to their kingdom. So we talk about diseases, like cancer, stuff like yeah. that can pass down from f family members who say, oh, it's hereditary. Yeah. So it's basically, you think it's people being cursed yeah. from generations to break that. Does mm. that not get scary? There's like an exorcism. You know what, it's an exorcism. That's it, it's the same same thing, just different terminology. This, it's more of a, um, a Catholic terminology, really, for it. Um, with as is a Christian term that we could say deliverance. It's not as brutal, is it? People know as an exorcism as the film. Yeah. The power of Christ compels yeah. you, kind of. People yeah. get scared. Like, this stuff will still scare the shit out of people. Yeah. But it also could be true, mm. because people that go through generations and generations and nothing really changes. Mm. People see a reflection of their mum, their dad or their uncle yeah. and then it's the same again and it passes down and passes down. Maybe there is something in it. Mm. So for you, when you started making your changes, did you know about this stuff at the start? When you Well, what made us get into this to begin with um, uh, was my wife had depression and anxiety and all, mm. all the stuff I said about. Uh, and then when we, we we started coming back to church, my, my um, eldest daughter started going to church first and I'm saying like, oh, we should get back. Like It's like two or three years of you know I've done all these wrong things and back puffing again which I hadn't done for years you know and done a couple of silly things and I said oh maybe we should um, get back to church as well like you know and so pretty early on when we went back to church um, I met this I bumped into this guy I used to see him every now and again and I bumped into him again just before we went back and um staying in touch with him and he was a Christian but I used to box him I used to box uh, at a gym called the Pe Peacock Gym in Canning Town like you know I was there for years and this guy used to be one of my sparring partners you know and I said to him um Oh, like, yeah, we got you. He said, Are you back at church? I said, Yeah, yeah, we're at this church. He said, oh, I'm going to come on Sunday. I'll bring my girlfriend. Well, his girlfriend was like a, a prophetess. So it's different anointings that people get as a Christian, you know what I mean? Um, uh, that are given by God, you know. And this particular gifting, she can, she hears from God. She, she can talk right into your life and tell you stuff about your life and stuff like that. And, and the imitation is clairvoyance and stuff. They imitate God, the devil imitates everything of God's kingdom, you know. And so she come and met us and, and she see what was on my wife straight away because she sees it. She's a seer as well. So she can see the devil, like the demons, and she can see the angels and all good stuff as well, like, you know. And she said, oh, can we go for a coffee? Like, she said, yeah, yeah. And swap numbers. They went, went out of coffee and, and she said, you know why I'm here, don't you? She said, yeah, I can feel things moving in me, like, you know. And she said, yeah, you're going to get delivered. So she ended up praying for her. She got delivered. Um, I think it was a couple, over a couple of times she got delivered of all, all these demons, which is what they are depression and anxiety sometimes you can get um it's not always demons but most of the time it is because sometimes it can be chemical imbalances and stuff like that you know, so you can't blame everything kind of demon you know what i mean but yeah. um some medical reasons as well yeah medical reasons yeah so it's not always uh, a demon you know um and so basically she got delivered she got completely set free uh, no more insomnia ocd anxiety depression gone when she give up, she's under mental health at a place in Epping. She give up all her tablets, all proper heavy duty tablets she was on, give them all up. Um, and we started thinking, wow, hang on, what other people can get help with this? You know, like it, it's a day, it, you know, like there's loads of people that are banned up with these things. Um, we kind of had compassion for them because of what we went through, you know. So you get a better understanding, yeah, of people's struggles, yeah, of that. No matter where you force your energy, that like, you can change. The mental madness, the whatever's the monkey mind people call it as well, where it's just it's just constant noise. So look, you know yourself with taking gear and that. Look, when I was taking gear, I used to go, What am I doing? And every Monday or Tuesday I say, right, no more. But then it's like, well, the devil kicks in. What is that then? It kicks in. Is that the subconscious mind? Is it a conscious mind? Or mm. is that what you say a demon saying, just take it? 
Because I still think about taking yeah. gain. I still think about gambling. Yeah. I just don't act on it. Mm. I believe I'm in full control. I believe I've mm. got the power. The only thing that I struggled with was eating. Mm. Overeating sugar. I eat my emotions, but now I'm 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 taking control of that. Now I'm mm. becoming a different animal through well being. Like I promote all this stuff. So mm. I need to lead by example. And by leading by mm. example, I need to put it into practice myself. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Like my fitness and that now is key. But I become obsessed. So mm. it's a difficult because then be the biggest podcast, then be the fittest. I've got a 50k run coming up, which is over 30 mile run on Saturday. Wow. Only started three mile runs. But wow. again, six, seven weeks ago, now I'm thinking, but I don't like running, but the feeling I get after that, my pain's away. I don't feel this up here. I don't feel, hear the noises. I don't mm. feel the, the hurt and the pain and the regret. Do you know what I mean? So when you start, mm. it's just, everybody's different in life, I guess. We mm. all see the world differently and, what you're saying people resonate with, or other people think he's fucking nuts. Exactly mm. what I'm saying. He's fucking nuts. Mm. Do you know what? <laughs> we're all fucking nuts, Kev. Yeah. Like, when you started, what were you thinking then? And someday, like for people f- first hearing this about deliverance and demons, how, what would you have thought when you were a drug dealer if somebody told you that? Uh, yeah, maybe I would have thought I was nuts, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, it's, it's one of them things you got you got to see it for yourself, really, to really fully understand it. To believe it. it. You know? Yeah, but but basically, um, you know when you, they say about, oh, you've got the devil on your shoulder and the angel on the mm-hmm. other shoulder, like trying to um, tell you good and bad, you know? It, it's kind of quite a lot of truth in that, you know? Yeah. So so what can happen is when, for when you start taking drugs, you can get different demons attached to, to, that come and enforce it. Yeah, to, to them drugs. L- mm-hmm. Listen, you have got your flesh as well, your body, which you, you, you know, um, so you, it ain't all the battle is with, with the devil, you know. Quite often we've got battles with our flesh. You know, we want to do things. It says in the Bible that um, our flesh is at enmity with God. It's a battle, it's a war with God. So our flesh wants to do everything that's, that's wrong. You know, even Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He, even he said, you know, I want to do the right thing, but my flesh don't want to do the right thing. It wants to do what's wrong. And, and this is this is a battle. So we can't blame everything on the demons because we have got our part to play. We can say no to things, you know, and resist it, you know. And I think that what's happened with you is you've overcame a lot of your demons and, and you've weakened a lot of your demons because you've subdued them by refusing to enter into the drugs and the gambling and stuff like that, you see. So we can take away their power a lot by refusing to do it and enter into it, but without even getting delivered, you know. Yeah. yeah. What about the people who's battling just now? that? Like- do you like it's hard, you know how hard that is like many times you changed and then you end up slipping back and then you mm. change and then you slip back and then you hit rock bottom and then the wife gets depression it can be difficult like there's so much pain people mm. are in so much pain and it's sad to see that like, i don't know all the answers you don't know all the answers but for people that's battling like drink addiction drug addiction any mm. sort of mental health what would you say then what advice would you give mm. for them do you think that's demons or do you think it's a part of so many different factors that mm. comes into play okay so here's what my brother uh, like in, when i say brother he's not my literal brother but in when when you go to church and you have your church family they they become your brothers and your sisters yeah so my brother marco um he said um he he had a really bad gambling addiction i'm sure you don't mind me saying this you know and uh suffered with drugs and stuff like that as well you know and so what happened with him how he overcame it is he got to the end of his self now, I've heard a, a couple of different people say this, where they couldn't do it. And they was like, Lord, you know, I can't do it on my own strength. I can't physically do this, but you can take this away easy from me. So you've got to have that faith and you've got to trust in God. You asked him once to take it away. And then after that, you thank him for it. So he said, thank you, Lord. I thank you that you've took it away from me. And, and you go, people, people, why would you say that if you've just took it? You just got to keep speaking it positivity yeah and speaking and tr- it's called faith and and um, sometimes people other testimonies of people that walk in a church get instantly delivered from like cocaine crack heroin addictions or alcohol addictions instantly delivered so it works like that with some people and other people have to go through a bit of a process but there's i, I don't know why and yeah. how exactly it works yeah, you know? i've spoke to a few people obviously nearly 200 people now and mm. Paul Ferris, who's became a good friend, who's well, very well known for his book, his mm. books and the film The Wee Man, proper What's criminal. Mm. But he was in his cell as well, and he heard a voice, like because he says that people think, yeah, he's fucking nuts." But changed his life as well. But yeah. like, a few people have heard voices. I think Marvin Herbert as well. I think when he was doing a sentence, I'm sure he heard the voice. 
But then again, they also dabble in drugs, just like myself. But if I heard voices, I'd be thinking, I'm just have, I'm just tripping balls here. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But maybe, I don't know, maybe the drugs as well open things in your brain. It also mm. destroys the brain cells. Mm. But like if I hear, vo- like you were sitting here and the door slammed. Mm. I'm thinking that's some creepy shit, man. Like you hit the door just slammed, mm. and there's no windows in here. There's, there's rooms at the back, and one of the doors have slammed. I'm thinking, oh, here we go. Mm. But do you think that like, how do you break the demons in? How do you break people possessed? Just pray for them. If they've yeah. got to truly believe themselves, though, uh, do you see their face change? Do you see things leaving their body massively? So, so my sister. Now I'll tell you about. Um, I've got. Okay, I've got two really good good ones. That's um, uh, uh, so my sister Nancy. Um, uh, I, I, you know, uh, but yeah, maybe I've got to be a bit careful of saying names and stuff. There's two 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 people uh, close to me, two two uh, women, and we prayed for them. One of them, she got delivered um, of uh, like she was dealing with what you said, white witchcraft. Oh no, I only do white witchcraft. No, I only do yoga. So yoga opens up the chakras, yeah, and it opens up. All sorts of, um, it's one of the worst ones, believe it or not, yoga. See, I've just been getting into yoga yeah. as well, and you've been saying yeah. that. Yeah, honestly, it's one of the worst ones. Um, especially, the, the, what happens is it, it goes up the spine. You've got seven uh, entry points into the spine. And when you, you get the final one, which is just below the skull, and when you that opens up, I mean, there's people that have said that they've gone actually mad because they couldn't handle it. Yeah, but it's all full demonic um, um, oppression or possession, you know. So you've got to be really careful of these sort of things. So, so yeah, one of them had this um, witchcraft thing and we prayed for... Com- like, um, I, I was talking to one of my friends who was at a CA meeting. I said to him, look, I really think that we can help people with addictions and stuff, you know. So um, if you've got anyone that you want to send... And at this particular day, I was at home working... Like, I was at home doing paperwork and stuff. I weren't at work. So he said, well, actually, I've got someone. She lives in she lives in Onga. Like, I'll... I'll um, I'll, 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 you know, tell her, like, I said, well, I'm in at the moment. She's in. Like, tell her to come round now, like, you know. He said, she's in a right bad way with depression and stuff, you know. So I said, all right, no worries. Um, anyway, he, she phones me up and she said, after she told us her testimony, she said, oh, I thought to myself, oh, I'm in a bad way. Like, she was suicidal, depression. I thought, what's two Christians going to do to help me? How are they going to be able to help me, you know? And so she cut, she comes right. Anyway, I talked to her on the phone. And I said, "Look, I think we can help you. Just you know, if you if you come round, look, I'm not one of them funny fellas. I've got my wife here. Put my wife on the phone to make sure she felt comfortable about coming round. She comes round. We pray for. It was pretty powerful. It was. Um, she was thrown to the floor, which ain't normally that dramatic. Normally, it's a little cough. They come out. It's done. Like it's not really that dramatic. You know what I mean? And um, but hers was thrown to the floor. She was trying to escape. Like she was trying to bang her head on the floor and say, she said San Kimmy was trying to tell me to get out the door which is the demon trying to tell her escape like you know but we just carried on praying for her and, and, and they come out um, and then her eyes opened that day she said she see this this she screamed when we was getting rid of this witchcraft demon and, and I said what's the matter she said she see this 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 um uh, ugly witch with piercing green eyes fly in front of her face like this and she said it just screwed at her like this and then flew out the window Oh, as we cast it, because we cast it to the abyss, you know, to the pit. If shit, it flew out the window as you cast it away, like you know, and um, and so we said you're going to be a seer, which she is. She's a prophetess now, you know. So she's got a really powerful story herself, you know. And um, and then the next person. Now I ain't never really got scared of it, you know. Some people think, God, don't you get scared? And I'm not the bravest person in the world. I'm not saying I've never never had fear, you know, but. But this particular one, which is only um, a couple of weeks ago, I won't say the person's name, but they're like a, an amazing, lovely woman of God. Yeah, my proper sister, right? And um, um, so, you know, they say it's the quiet ones you've got to watch out for, like, you know. Uh, now I know why they say it, you know. So we start praying and then and then she, she starts giggling and that, you know. And we're thinking, oh, is she getting the giggles? But there's a spirit called Jezebel, which is widely spoken about in, in the book of Revelation, in, in, you know, for the end times, what's coming, you know, um, saying it'd be a big problem. And um, so, and I'm thinking, is that Jezebel or is that her? Like, because Jezebel always giggles like little naughty school kids, you know. And so we start, I start praying for her and the next minute, anyway, she's proper laughing and, and then, then spe- starts speaking out of her and stuff like that. And it was proper, weren't a, a possession because she can't be possessed because she's, she's a Christian, she's sealed, you know. But this demon starts, um, anyway, it, the one we end up calling up, she had, uh, there's a demon called Satan, yeah? Satan, Beelzebub, uh, and there's another one. Not not the actual devil, but they're the uh, demon name. So it's his personality, it ain't actually him, you know? So she's got this Satan demon, right? She's like, screaming at me, she's like this. 
She's got her hands next to her behind her back like this and she's standing up and I'm standing in front of her and uh, normally my wife will stand in front and I stand behind in case they go over in the spirit and I can catch them, you know. But I've ended up in front of her and she's got a fist like this at her side and she's just screwing, looking like this. And she's, she, then she'd come to me and go, oh, I'm really sorry, but I really feel I want to kill you and I love you. You know, you're my brother. I don't, I don't want to kill you. I said, don't worry, it's the demon. Don't worry about it. It's fine, you know. So she's like this, screwing. And it was really bizarre. I haven't seen this... You know, her, her face was actually all puffed up and stuff around her eyes and her, her face all, all looks a bit puffed up. This is like probably the worst manifestation I've seen, like, you know. And um, and, and and her eyes were shut and all of a, and all of a sudden, I'm, I, I, I'm going to put my hands up, right? Both, uh, both my hands. I did flap a little bit. I've got to be honest with you, I did flap a little <laughs> yeah, bit. I've been out that door in an instant. Man. I did a little bit for, for, for a moment because I've had big geezers talking all different voices and all that. We're, we're, we're delivering and it ain't been a problem. But this... This this one, I thought, wow! All of a sudden, her eyes are shut like this. But when she's leaning forward and looking up at me, all of a sudden, I see these eyes looking at me through her eyelids. You know, which is I don't, I'm not a seer normally. I don't normally see these sort of things, but I did this time. You know, and for that split second, I kind of stepped off a little bit, gathered my thoughts, then the Holy Spirit kicked in, and then I got went back with anger, like a righteous anger. You know, and I was like, right, you're getting it now because I got feel. You know, it was a spirit took over. You know. And, uh, and yeah, we set them free and um, it's just transformed them. You know, we, we just see people getting, like the, the first one I was telling you about got set free with depression and stuff. This one um, is, normally what happens is if you're a person with um, the anointing that God's given you for speaking, like yourself, right? Quite often, you, you've, you've all right with it, but quite often the enemy are trying to shut your mouth up, you know, if you're going to be a preacher or an evangelist or whatever one that tells people about god so he'll try and he will attack you in that particular area but but since we've done this and got these spirits out and the ones that was holding her mouth shut she just properly come out of her shell like you know and she's really doing well so yes yeah, it's, it's, it's such a good ministry to be in like people obviously watching us they'll be thinking what the f like people watch horror movies exorcisms they watch all that yeah. and think it's all the bollocks like yeah you're a man who's living it and seen yeah. it like yeah it's, it's nuts, man. It is nuts. It's it? nuts. Yeah. Like, so for people struggling now, Kev, you've lived the life, been a drug dealer, armed robber. Now you're trying to heal people. You've healed yourself. How how are you feeling, first of all, now? How's your life? Okay, so I always suffered with a lot of rejection. Yeah, um, I used to feel quite rejected with things and stuff. And, you know, a lot of different people in my life. And, you know, I had quite a bit of rejection and stuff, you know. And, um, uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of, um, a lot better. I'm not saying I ain't, I'm a hundred percent, you know, but I'm so much better than what I ever was, uh, before, you know what I mean? Uh, with the rejection side of it and stuff. Mm. And yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm doing all right now. Well, yeah. Day and day I've seen, do you ever get angry yourself still? Do you ever think? Yeah. You know what? I'm human. This is the thing. So mm -hmm. sometimes people go like, oh yeah, <sighs> look at him meant to be a Christian, you know? Well, Look at how I was before I was a Christian. Do you know mm. what I mean? I can still get the ump sometimes. You know what I mean? And still be a bit impatient. You know, which is some of the things that I used to be terrible at. You know what I mean? I'm much much better now, but it's a journey, and I'm growing, and I'm getting better. I'm not getting worse anymore. I'm getting better. You know, so I'm not perfect. Uh, you know, people might see me after this goes out and think. Oh, look, oh, look at him. He's meant to be this man. Yeah, listen, I'm not perfect. Jesus was perfect, but I'm not, you know, but, um, but I've come a long way from where I was, you know. How do people treat you, Kev, knowing what you do now? Uh, Are you accepted with it? Or do people kind of think, mm, I'm not going to speak to him? Yeah, yeah, um, people, yeah, people do. I mean, you know, the people that know that I do deliverance are normally people, a lot of people that I did deliver, basically, you know mm. what I mean, that, that we help and pray for. Like, we, we mentor a lot of people as well, and, you know, we sort of show them the things we never learnt when we was Christians, you know what I mean? So, yeah. we, you know, we do help a lot of people. And For anybody struggling, Kev, people that's going through depression, anxiety, all the worst things possible mm. to, that a human can go through, people battling with addictions, what advice would you give for them? Find yourself a good church. Before you do that, cry out to God. Cry out to God, yeah? Cry out from your heart. And say, Lord, please, Lord, I repent of my sins. Lord, I invite you. Listen, you need to get Jesus in your heart, yeah? So you've got goodness in your heart. I'm not saying instantly your problems will be solved. It, it, you still have trials and tribulations and, and you still have life to deal with. But you've got a peace, first of all, which is what I've got now. I've got a peace in my heart that I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. I haven't got that fear anymore of, of I'm going to hell and I'm... 
you know what I mean? I'm a, such a bad person. I've done these bad things and stuff. And some people can get set free straight away, you know. But what I would say is um, invite Jesus into your heart. Yeah, say, Father God, don't, don't worry about matey next door or your friends or if I know this goes out in, into a, um, a lot of the prisons and stuff, right? Don't worry about your, your cellmate or your guy next door or anybody else, yeah, because it's about you and God. When you're standing between God and Judgment Day, none of your friends, your family, none of, no one else will be there to be between you and God, whether you've done enough to get in. That's what it'll be, right? So for what I say is invite Jesus into your heart. Ain't got to be a big fancy prayer yeah um it's just got to be from your heart because they're the prayers that are powerful and you just got to say father god please forgive me of all my sins lord um from this day forward i choose to follow you and turn from my old life now repenting when you repent of your sins it doesn't mean just to say you're sorry that's a small part of it it means to turn from your ways and and, and sin no more of course, you're going to make mistakes along the way as you're trying and you get better and better as you go along with it, you know. But just say, Lord, please forgive me. Um, Father, I, I invite your Holy Spirit into my heart, Lord. I pray that you'll come and dwell and live in me, Lord. And I pray that you change me from the inside out. I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross um, for me. Um, um, he rose again on the third day and he's coming back again for me one day. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, you just turn from your old way and say, Lord, I'm no longer going to run from you. I'm going to run to you. Yeah, and that's what you do. That's a, just a basic little prayer. You can look it up online. There's different prayer of salvation mm. is called and you can get the, you know, yeah. more fuller prayers. But Listen, it's fair enough. It's your mm. story, your beliefs, Kevin. Mm. It's changed your life. It's changed Zoe's mm. life. It's, it's changing other people's lives. And if it's changing your life, you're not harming anybody, then so be it, my brother. I believe it's mm. a good thing for anybody that's watching. Maybe they can find the answers, and if you're saying that mm. is the answers for people, then why not give it a try? Mm. Nothing to lose. Mm. Nothing to lose. And even if, you know what, even if there's people out there listening, they say, yeah, I don't really believe that, you know what I mean? I don't, what harm is it? You've got nothing to lose. Invite Jesus. He's a gentleman. He's at the door knocking. He ain't going to barge his way in. But once you invite him in like I did in the prison, even though I forgot about him, I'd invited him in. So I don't think that maybe he would have come to me the way he did unless I'd already invited him in my heart. You What's see? your nephew's name again? Oh, Brad. Yeah, okay, my nephew Brad. Brad. Oh, Brad. Love you. Love you, brother. Um, mm. Yeah, he's, he, he, he loves the show and stuff. And um, he was like oh, wow, hang on, how come James is like friends of Luke? I see him, like, he shouted him out for the wedding. I said, yeah, yeah, he was at the wedding, like, you know. He was meant to come as well to the oh, wedding, but, it? yeah, there was a couple of stuff mm -hmm. that went on at the time that he couldn't he couldn't make it in the end. Um, but, but yeah, so love you, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? Yeah, just like I say, um, back to really what I was saying about, you know, um, uh, just give it a go. You've got nothing to lose. Don't worry about anybody else. It's between you and God. Uh, it's a personal relationship between you and God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to finish up maybe a prayer for anybody watching, maybe struggling, or you can send a positive message mm. for whatever. Listen, it could change your life. You just don't know mm. who's watching, who's needing this message, and okay. every guest is different. So I don't know. You said you were going to do one to start, but whenever. So. We've kind of gone off it, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. So, okay, yeah. So, Father God, uh, Lord, I call upon your Holy Spirit, Lord, because this is all this stuff I've been talking about, Lord. I can't do this on my own. It's not about what I can do. I'm just a normal fella like everybody else listening to this show. Uh, so, Lord, you come by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill me up afresh, Lord. Fill up each one of us. Fill up this um, flat with your presence, Lord. Lord, we just speak directly to people suffering, Lord, that are going through different afflictions, depression, anxiety, um, uh, insomnia, OCD, a lot of the things that my wife suffered from, or any other sort of mental illness. We speak directly to the mind, right now to their minds, to any demons that's keeping them bound. I'm speaking directly to you right now. I bind you up with an Ecclesiastes 412 three-folded cord from head to foot. And I rain down holy fire upon you right now. I command you, leave them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Come out of them vessels. I, I command you in the mighty name of Jesus, the name above every name. Lord, I just pray, Father God, that the peace of your Holy Spirit may de descend down upon the people listening right now, Lord, that they may feel your presence and experience you, Lord, in a mighty way, Lord, that they may know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Lord, that you're real, that you're real, Lord. Make yourself known to them, Lord. Appear to them in dreams, dreams and visions, Lord. Make yourself known to them, Lord, so that they may be saved uh, and have that peace of mind that I have, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Kev, 
Pleasure, Absolute pleasure, my brother. Oh, God bless you. you. God bless you, you too. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.